Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, today we will be discussing uh, the question, uh, will CSA help realize RED? Um, this will be a one hour and a half hour, one hour and a half discussion. We will have two panels, uh, one on the science side of the interaction between agriculture and forests, and a second panel on implementation of RED and CSA. Um, each presenter will take around five minutes. We will have one discussion in the middle of, of the two panels, and then we'll move on to the second panel and have another set of questions and answers. Um, we want you to know uh, you're welcome to ask your questions in Spanish also. Uh, the presenters can, can answer them that way as well. And well, uh, I would like to first tell you a little bit about why we uh, want to have this session. Uh, first, to know, first of all, um, we, we know agriculture is the main driver of deforestation, so it's really important to see the two interactions that are happening here, agriculture and forestry. And, and then, well, we, we see that there are still a series of unanswered questions about these interactions. Some of them, for example, are uh, uh, can, ag can making agriculture more efficient and productive really reduce pressure on forests? Uh, how innovative can CSA and RED plus in landscapes actually be? And how can CSA, a more adaptation-focused approach, help realize mitigation goals of RED? And uh, among other questions. So uh, I would like now to pass, uh, introduce the panelists. Uh, the science panel, we will listen first to Man Martin Herald, professor at Wageningen University. He will talk to you about understanding agriculture-driven deforestation. Then we will have Rosa, Rom Rosa Roman, who from Wageningen University, and she will speak on greenhouse gas emission hotspots. Then we will have Marina Rufino, she's from CCAFS, and she will talk to us about pantropical emissions and mitigation hotspots and potential for climate smart agriculture. After Marina, we will listen to Sarah Carter. She is a researcher at Wageningen University and she will talk to us about land grabbing and RED plus uh, and empirical analysis. And after Sarah, we will listen to Professor Arold Angelsen from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences on Agricultural Technologies. Uh, he will talk about agricultural technologies, intensification, and deforestation. So now I'll pass the floor to Martin Herald. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to start off the session with talking a bit about agriculture as a driver of deforestation. I think that's pretty clearly understood. It is the most important one. And um, if you look then at South America, since we are in South America, on how deforestation is linked to agriculture, we can see here that it's a map that shows on a sample-based approach the land use change on forest. So this is deforestation. Uh, and we see the follow-up land use that is following that deforestation. That's based on the FAO definition of forest, so it is an actual land use change. And you can see basically, oops, that's how quickly the wrong button goes. <laughs> Let me just give me a second whether I can fire that up again. There you yeah. go, I'm sorry for that. Um, to see basically where, first of all, uh, most of the deforestation is, and that's widely known, it's the arc of deforestation here in the Brazilian Amazon, and I'll just it's basically here. And then you see the size basically of the circuit show how much deforestation there is, and then you can basically see what type of follow-up land use was actually mapped there. This is based on the remote sensing survey. Um, if you look at the statistics, uh, you can see that's maybe an interesting number that for South America, the deforestation is about a bit over 40,000 uh, square kilometers per year. It's a bit higher for the second period that was looked at 2000 and 2005. And if you look at the statistics, about 70% is, uh, of the deforestation is followed by pasture. Uh, 
uh, which is quite the predominant uh, type of change. The actual conversion to agriculture, mostly commercial agriculture, is in the order of 11 to 14 percent, so it's a much smaller fraction. Um, but if you add up livestock, the different types of agriculture, we end up being nearly at 90 percent of the deforestation in South America is due to uh, agriculture. And uh, that is not necessarily new in terms of the overall number, but it's also perhaps interesting to look at the pattern, and perhaps it's also interesting to look at the patterns and how they change over time, because we looked at South America in two periods in time. One is from 1990 to 2000, and the other one is from 2000 to 2005. So in the maps that are shown here then, basically, and I'd like to first uh, press the wrong button again, sorry, um, like to draw your attention to the map on the on your right, uh, where you see basically in red where the deforestation from agriculture has declined in these two periods, so between 1990, 2000, and 2000, 2005, and in green where the deforestation to crop agriculture has increased. So basically, you see basically a shift of the expansion of agriculture um, on forests. And what you see that across country boundaries, you see this decline in agricultural expansion here and that, that moving of the hotspots into the forest, which shows how dynamic that driver is. The overall amount did not change so much, but the patterns actually quite largely changed. You see how dynamic that driver is moving more into the actual higher carbon forest areas over that period. You see a similar map here for pasture expansion. Here you see it's a bit more of a distinct pattern, probably much more regional pattern. Uh, you also see that it's quite an area in red, which means pasture expansion has declined for these regions and the green spots where actually pasture expansion is taken up, again, more in these um, higher carbon, denser forest areas. So if agriculture is 90% of deforestation in South America and depending on which numbers you look at, um, 80 to 90 percent for the pantropics, is it then also it receiving 80 to 90 percent of the attention when it comes to country strategies and, and in terms of red plus? Um, we did an empirical analysis uh, that looked into what kind of uh, interventions countries have been putting forward in their readiness activities. And we separated the countries in two types. One type of country looked um, where we have, uh, have seen or were able to interpret a good understanding of the drivers that were translated into interventions, red plus interventions. So a series of red plus inter interventions that you see here written. And we had a series of countries who have put forward interventions for red plus and have not taken, uh, at least developed a clear relationship between the drivers, understanding of the, of the drivers in the intervention. And what you, what you see is the two patterns that we see in blue, the countries who have just put forward red plus intervention without considering drivers, and the red ones, the other one. So for the countries in blue, which have not taken their drivers in, information into account, you see a lot of, let's say, forest-related interventions that have been put forward. Sustainable forest management, protected area strategies, afforestation, reforestation, rehabilitation of degraded land, whereas the ones who have taken these drivers into account really end up with the ones which are related towards these main drivers, agriculture, uh, livestock, um, mining, uh, and some of the other infrastructure-related expansion types. So we do see that there is quite a disconnect in at least what has been proposed by countries in terms of taking the drivers into account. And what we're learning from, from that, the more we will see strategies to address deforestation that are based on a better understanding of drivers, we are likely to see more uh, of these kind of interventions that basically say, if you want to address our most important drivers, we have to think outside the forest sector. We have to look at other sectors, mostly agriculture, to solving our forest problem. And so, to conclude from my side, um, um, we have seen agriculture as the key driver. That is not necessarily new, but the solution to that is largely outside the forests. And I think that is one of the reasons we're talking about red plus in landscapes, we're talking about a more integrated framework, we're talking about that to change activities outside the forest to reduce pressure on the, on the forest itself. That, that The size of that landscape can vary certainly if you have to deal with a highly dynamic commercial agricultural drivers we've seen for South America or whether you have more of a locally driven um, 
um, um, locally driven expansion of ag agriculture. We also, second point, have to realize that the follow-up land use that is related to deforestation also by itself creates emissions. I made the point that about 70% of land clearing in South America is to pasture, which is associated with livestock and livestock emissions. So there is an additional cumulative emission that is happening on these, um, uh, uh, on these lands. Uh, in addition, if you think about it, to the ones that related to you know, the, the loss of carbon stocks itself and the avoided sink if we really want to be comprehensive. So the mitigation options are really broader than just forests. And I think that's an important message that we particularly see also for South America. South America. So this kind of idea of red plus and landscapes, thinking about from an integrated point of view, uh, we, we saw in many sessions how that makes a lot of sense. And of course, and this is my last point then, climate smart agriculture is not a field where I come from, but it's clearly that there are some similar objectives that we see. So this idea of you know, achieving both adaptation and mitigation goals, including uh, reducing the pressure on the forest, which conceptually, I, th I think, is a good opportunity to try to think about how they can link together. And um, that was a bit the purpose of that session. Although I have to say that my perception is so far this link is not there. And I guess we'll hear more about that and uh, hopefully have an interesting discussion on that. Thank you. Thank you. Can you pass it to Sarah, please? Uh, thank you, Martin. Now we will listen to Rosa Roman. Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone can hear me well? Yes? Perfect. Um, the next presentation, um, it's a hotspot of land use emissions in the Pantropics for the period 2000 and 2005. And I would like to pick it up from the last remarks from Martin on the need for having a more integrative approach between these two sides of the coin, agriculture versus uh, deforestation. This is not yet, we are not yet there, but they are part of the same story. And then therefore, it is um, quite interesting and it's quite timing to have them um, together, not only from a point of view of emission reporting, estimates of, of the emissions from the entire land use sector, but also from mitigation options. And um, this is also timing, like for the first time, the fifth assessment report is um, exposing and it's um, reporting the emissions from the land use in an integrated manner. It's an AFLU uh, reporting. So we don't have LULUCF on one side, forests, and then agriculture in the other. But for the first time, we are having this um, fifth assessment report with this integrated approach. Um, and therefore, also other interesting approaches or, or, or benefits from having integrative agriculture forestry um, assessments is the fact that they improve consistency. If you have um, emission reports from the land use sector that includes both of them, you are forced to have harmonized de definitions. You're also forced to have um, better understanding of the availability of the land uses in the land uh, use sector, and therefore you have minimized risks of double counting. Also, um, the benefit of having these integrated approaches is that you have a better understanding of the drivers. You include the drivers within um, the, the sector. And also, you have a better understanding of the trades off between um, mitigation of requirement for the land use and adaptation. Uh, we have to bear in mind that the land use sector um, bears to big responsibilities, food security and sustaining livelihoods, and therefore mitigation needs need to be certainly uh, embedded into adaptation requirements. Um, so the presentation I will be showing today is um, research that it's a top-down approach based on independent data sets, so it's not a bottom-up from the countries, but on the other side, it's a top-down approach that tries to identify the regions that have larger land use emissions in the pantropics, and this is our definition of hotspot, areas with larger greenhouse gas uh, emissions from the land use sector. And um, not only to visualize where they are, but also to identify what are the drivers behind these hotspots. And several um, benefits could come from, from this research, which would be one of them could be to help prioritize certain areas that are the ones that have the larger emissions, and also to prioritize um, mitigation action based on the drivers behind these hotspots. Uh, we will follow a three-step process, which basically first consisted on identifying uh, what are the emissions associated to the land uses. And for that, we relied on the IPCC AFOLU 2006 uh, Good 
practice guidance. So we identified what are uh, for the six sectors, uh, for the six land uses in, within the uh, IPCC uh, good practice guidance of 2006. Uh, what are the main activities leading to emissions? And also, what are the gases associated to these emissions and what were the main pools contributing to these emissions? But from the entire panorama of emissions from the land use, what we did was selecting only those that were key emission sources. And we used the fifth assessment report to identify which were those key emission sources, which means basically those that contribute the most to the total emissions of the land use sector, uh, to run our hotspot of, of uh, land use emissions. So you, I will show you in the next slide which were these uh, activities that were the key sources. Um, the second step then was to collect these data sets, especially explicit data sets that were published and that are peer reviewed. And uh, we ran some quality control and quality assessment analysis to identify data caveats and uh, to assess future needs for, for data. Uh, and then the last one was to combine them through Monte Carlo analysis, uh, not only to look at the total aggregated emissions from the land use sector, but also to look at uncertainties, although I will not look at I will not discuss uncertainties in this presentation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so this is a summary of the key source emissions that um, were identified in the fifth assessment report to contribute the most to the land use uh, sector. Basically, there are six major activities behind these emissions. One is deforestation. The other is degradation, both harvesting and fire. The other has to do with livestock emissions, which includes enteric fermentation and manure management. And the other two relate to crop management and uh, rice body emissions, and they both relate to soil management emissions. So these are the six main contributing activities within the land use sector that, um, that are reported, as I said before, in the fifth assessment report and that we included. And here in the data set column, you have the references of the data set that we used. We um, focus on three main gases, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, and two main pools of uh, carbon emissions, above ground biomass and soil. Uh, just for you to understand the following, or the final map of the greenhouse gas um, hotspot inventions, I wanted to show how these six um, activities or processes that are contributing the most to the emissions look. So it's a spatial explicit, it's 0.5 degrees spatial resolution, and it's annual emissions based on these different uh, data sets that we covered uh, that are global scale, although our um, analysis is only pantropical. Just briefly, for you to see that it's a spatial based analysis. And there are uncertainties associated to all of these data sets that I will not show you right now. What I wanted to show you is this analysis. This is the final Monte Carlo run, 1000 Monte Carlo runs, uh, combining all the key source emissions for the land use sector. And it's a gross emission and a CO2 equivalent. It basically means that we have CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide incorporated into this map. The first thing we see is that there is different continental contributions to this um, land use uh, sector. In red, you have those areas that have the highest um, combined emissions for the land use sectors. So those are the hotspots of emissions. And one of the utilities could be to, to focus and target mitigation actions on those regions. Um, so basically, this is integrating both agriculture and, and forestry emissions. And what I would wanted to show is how, if we separate by gases, how the the emission uh, hotspot before would, would offer interesting information. What I show you here, it's still hotspot of emissions, but on the above panel you have CO2 gross emissions, and on the lower panel you have non-CO2 gross emissions. Basically, this roughly means that on the top you have emissions coming from forests and grasslands, and on the lower part you have more related agricultural and livestock emissions, right? So here we're starting dividing drivers behind these hotspots of emissions. Be aware that the scales are not the same. So the contribution and the mitigation potential from non-CO2, mainly agriculture and livestock emissions, is half of the potential of forest and uh, grasslands uh, emissions. And that's quite interesting when dealing with mitigation strategies. What I wanted to show you briefly, not only the difference in continents, but the fact that when you separate between these types of gases and, and associated drivers, you see 
new patterns arising. So you see, for instance, in the American continent, like the contribution of forests on the northern and arch of the forestation of southern Amazonia as a main contribution for CO2. But then if you move it into non-CO2 emissions, then you see all the contribution from livestock and um, croplands on the southern part of, of Brazil, but also picking up in Argentina and Uruguay and, and the northern part of Colombia, Venezuela, and Mexico, for instance. Another interesting uh, point to remark here by subdividing the contribution of the different greenhouse gases is on a CO2 analysis and, um, and, and the role of, of forests and grasslands, you would not see the large contribution that the Asian continent has in terms of emitting uh, livestock and, and paddy, paddy uh, rice uh, soil emissions. So this is quite interesting in terms of subdividing uh, not only where are the larger emissions, but what are the different gases contributing and the drivers behind this. Um, another interesting approach would be to separate the concept of gross emissions versus net emissions. For mitigation action, net is, is the one that we should be focusing on. What is the difference? The difference is that on the above panel figure, you have all these red hotspot emissions that in only incorporate sources of emissions. While in this lower panel, you have also included the sinks, so the carbon sequestration processes. A large difference would be the African continent. We can see how Africa is largely contributing to emissions, but if we run a net analysis, short time emissions like biomass burning, which is one of the drivers of African emissions, um, disappears because this is an emission that it's a short term emission that will be recovered by regeneration of the grasslands the following year. So in net terms, this, this, this disappears. But then emissions from livestock and from uh, crop uh, soil management do not change, and the same happens for forests. Um, and the final graph would be to link the spatial distribution of these hotspots of emissions with the drivers behind it. So, and what we see is in this y-axis we have the um, mitigation potential, so the final estimates of the AFLU combined emissions, and here we have the, uh, the different drivers, which are the data sets that we selected. And we see continents like Africa are contributing with their hotspots of emissions mainly through fire. So if we want to invest uh, on, on mitigation activities, fire would be our first goal. And if we look at the distribution of this fire, we would see that it's on Miombo fire, so it's dry forests. Uh, while if we look at the the forestation driver, we see that Central America and South, Central and South America is mainly, um, emissions are mainly related to the forestation, for instance, and mainly on wet rainforests. And then contribution of livestock and rice um, and crops are the main drivers behind uh, Asia. So we have different continents with different distribution of the hotspots, but also with different drivers behind that. And that should give us hints uh, on how to start mitigation initiatives. And this should or perhaps would be useful for countries that are, don't have all that much data on their own uh, national communications to use these global data sets that already exist as a, as a way to start uh, dealing with what would be their mitigation potentials. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Now uh, we will listen to Mariana Rufino. Uh, we heard Martin Herold talking about uh, drivers of deforestation and his hope that uh, intervention in the agricultural sector could help us to save the forest. And then we heard Rosa explaining, um, talking about the, the global distribution of hotspots uh, for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so how can we use this technical information? What I want to talk about is to show you how you could link these hotspots, this driver information, with interventions such as uh, Climate Smart Agriculture and RED. Um, so if we look again at the map of, of Rosa just showed on net emissions, we see this uniform or less uniform distribution of emissions, but we know that to mitigate these emissions, um, decisions and planning and so on need to happen at a different level, which is not the global level. Um, <laughs> everyone suffering with this. Uh, so to mitigate emissions, um, we need targets for emission reductions. Um, those targets could happen at, at different levels, but here in the climate negotiations, we are talking mainly about the national level. 
Uh, we need planning, and planning at the national level is crucial. It is crucial because it requires uh, financial support, because it represents implementation challenges. So what I want to show you is a method that we are testing to see how we could um, assess interventions in the framework of this uh, national level planning. Oops, it went too fast. Oh, let me help you to understand this diagram. Um, so this is a tool to set priorities. And the example I'm gonna show you has been tested at the national level. So the first step, let me get you up in the figure is to calculate country level emissions. And what uh, Rosa was telling you is that there are those uh, national, uh, global, available product that you can use. And so the first question is, um, should we look at the forest sector, at agriculture driven deforestation, or should we look at mitigation in the agricultural sector? First question is, what dominates? Is it agricultural emissions or is agriculture driven deforestation emissions? So yes, no, so um, let me take you to the right side of the graph. So yes, most of the emissions are coming from agricultural driven deforestation. So the first step is let's estimate the potential to reduce deforestation. So um, what I'm gonna show you in this right side of the, of, of the figure is uh, how can we assess the likelihood uh, of implementing um, land, land sparing uh, interventions like closing the yield gap or using available, and I put it between parentheses, degraded land because um, in some part of the world it's degraded land, in some part of the world it's simply unutilized land. So the question is, is there, is there a yield gap that we can close? And you can think immediately about climate smart agriculture. If we are going to close the yield gap, we are going to do it climate smartly. Um, so the question is, is, is there potential to close the yield gap or to use unutilized land? No, if there is no potential for that, then that country has a low mitigation potential is something we have to address with different interventions. If there is potential to close the gap, the yield gap or to use unutilized land, well, then we need to see at the national level, for example, what are these enabling factors to avoid the deforestation. We continue here. Next question is, we are thinking about the implementation level. Is there good governance or there is high engagement in red? Yes, if there is, then we are aware that we need to check for risk factors. And in these ex examples, in this example, we think about the dependency of a country on the agricultural sector to generate their income or the risk of food insecurity, which is what poor countries are putting as an argument for not engaging in red. Well, um, is there a, um, if there is dependency or food insecurity, then we need to address the risk. And you heard in different presentations how this risk can be addressed, and the previous session was on safeguards. Um, no, there, are, there is no problem to implement um, mitigation intervention, so we can think about climate smart agriculture and or expand into this available unutilized land. Um, so this is an example for the, for the an area where the emissions are dominated by agricultural de deforestation. If you take the middle part of the graph, we are in, the, in, the, in those cases where the emissions from agriculture and from agriculture driven deforestations are important at the country level. So it's not dominated by agriculture driven deforestation. We still estimate the potential for reducing deforestation. If there is the potential to close the yield gap or to utilize unutilized land, we follow the same path. Um, let me get you to this point that if governance is a problem, this is a clear sign for support and governance before we try implementation of, of any action. Um, so if you have some of those countries where emissions are dominated by agricultural activities, then we estimate the potential for agricultural mitigation. We ask, is there a, a high emission gap in agriculture? No, if there is no, well, then there is low mitigation potential, a problem we need still to sort out. 
Um, if there is a high emission gap, then we again check for enabling factors so that we can go to uh, try implementation. We ask about governance. If there is no go good governance, it needs support. If there is good governance, then we still need to check for risk factors, and we were talking about food insecurity or income dependency on the agricultural sectors. If there are risk factors, we need to address those. If not, we can implement climate smart agriculture in existing agricultural land. Well, um, what I want to highlight is that uh, there is a, a always hope if there are problems. These problems are highlighted in this diagram. There is low mitigation potential. The problem still needs to be addressed. If there are risks, we need to address those risks. But if not, we have a way to target the intervention to reduce emissions either from the agricultural sector or from uh, deforestation. Um, so we, uh, we did this exercise with available products. We, uh, there is a, a, a product available on um, the yield gap on, this, on, on the main cereals in the world. And what you can see in different colors is the mitigation potential from low, medium to high. So here you can see to close, close in the yield gap, where there is high potential is where you see orange. And then the other option that we were proposing is using uh, unutilized land again. And you can see those countries in orange are those which have the high potential for the intervention. And then what you see in the lower panel is these enabling factors. So with these countries that have a high governance are the ones where we could probably proceed with implementation. And on the right panel, you see the countries that have high engagement in red, where the likelihoods where the interventions are going to be successful are higher. So to conclude, what we are arguing here is that um, at the national level, it will be useful to assess at the same time the forest and the agricultural sector together because there are opportunities to combine emission reductions. Um, then it will be useful to assess the likelihood that these interventions are going to be effective. And by saying this is that we need to look at if there is an enabling environment and how to estimate the risk of implementing mitigation interventions. Um, this also allows countries to assess the sort of support needed. And we, we can say that in many of these countries, according to our assessment, Climate smart agriculture could support the realization of RED. Ready? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, now we will listen to Sarah Carter. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about um, a short study that looks into land grabbing in RED Plus. Um, this study was led by Marc Amur Mancou, um, and it's a submitted paper, um, so the results may be uh, going to change in the future, but this is a pre preliminary look. Um, so first I'm going to define what land grabbing is, and this study uses the definition from the land matrix data set, and we also use the data from the land matrix data set, and that compiles information on um, land grabbing events which happen all around the world. And this data, these data are freely available on the internet. So the definition which they have is that land grabbing is a transfer of rights to use, control, or ownership of land through a lease or con concession that's been initiated since 2000, covers an area more than 200 hectares, and it also, and more interestingly, implies the potential conversion of land from um, a community use or a smallholder farming use or as an ecosystem services provision, uh, an area for ecosystem services, ecosystem service provision to a commercial use. And actually the orange circle that you can see on the left hand panel, this represents the area of land which fulfills this definition. So we're talking about a large area of land um, distributed around the world. And crucially, 80% of this, or approximately 80% of this land, is grabbed for agricultural use. The usual sub suspects are there, 
palm oil, um, soybean production, and, and other kind of um, agricultural crops. Um, okay. Yeah, to point. <laughs> right. Um, so why are we interested in looking at land grab and Red Plus at the same time? Well, there are many similarities between the two. Um, they're both of interest to sustainability science. They're both um, important in terms of emissions, mitigation of emissions, a source of emissions, deforestation, reduction of deforestation, biodiversity. And they're also potentially competing for land. And they affect land tenure, access rights, issues of neo-colonialism come up. Um, but there's also some differences between the two processes because they're both happening independently from one another. Um, Red Plus tends to have some quite harsh uh, frameworks around it in terms of regulations through safeguards, through um, implementation bodies who have rules and regulations about what can and can't be done. And typically these help to ensure that country development objectives are respected and that the projects are sustainable and equitable. Land grabs operate under different laws, country laws. Um, some countries have um, restrictions on foreign ownership of land um, and other assets within the country, for example. So um, this map shows um, incidences of land grabbing, and what we see is three different colors in the map. One is um, the yellow colored countries, and this is countries who are investing in land grabs. And then we have orange countries who are objects of land grabs, so that's where the land grabs are taking place. And we also have green countries who are both, so they may be investing in land grabbing within their own country or in a different country. And we can see from the panel on the right that most of land grabbing is happening within Sub-Saharan Africa and also East Asia and Pacific. So when we add the map of Red Plus, it's a similar map. We have yellow being the countries who are donors of Red Plus, um, orange the recipients, and green who are um, both donors and recipients. And this is in international frameworks, also in local um, and national Red Plus projects. And we see there are some similarities here. We have um, some countries who are, tend to be both donors of Red Plus and investors, some countries who tend to have land grabbing happening within their country and also are recipients of Red Plus funds. So from these maps, we come up with two key conclusions. And one is that countries who are objects of land investments are nine times more likely to be engaged in Red Plus. And the second one is that countries who are invested in large land deals or land grabbing um, are also likely to be donors of Red Plus. So we can't really separate the two processes because they're happening within the same landscape. Um, the analysis also looked at um, variables which could explain the incidences of either a country being a donor or an investor of land, I mean, an investor of land grabs or a recipient of land grabs, and also a donor or a recipient of Red Plus. And we find some interesting um, results. I'll just highlight a couple. One is that but countries who are more likely to be engaged in Red and objects of land grab have a minimum regulatory requirement. So it means that they, they're not the poorest, most corrupt countries if you're looking at um, the range of governance of countries within the whole world. Well, these tend to be countries who have some capacity to manage their assets. Um, another interesting conclusion is that there are a number of countries who are both investing in land grabbing and are recipients of those deals. So there's some um, responsibility of the country itself to manage its own land management system by itself. So what does this mean? Well, the study also looks at risks um, of both land grabbing and, and Red Plus taking place. Um, and uh, we look at the risks to biodiversity and risks to com communities. And both countries who are engaged in Red Plus and also who have land grabbing occurring within the country um, tend to have a lower human development index 
um, and also lower access to water, which are both kind of indicators of the vulnerability of local communities to change in land use and land tenure, land access, these kind of things. And we also see that red plus tends to occur, as you might expect, in countries with a high biodiversity and species extinction risk. So, um, what does this mean? Well, um, because land grabbing and red plus are both happening in the same place, land grabbing is a potential driver of deforestation and must be addressed within red plus strategies and taken seriously. The second one, and also, um, there's a potential for climate smart interventions to be implemented in those areas where land is converted to agriculture, for example, which can help promote um, land sparing, which may um, avoid deforestation and, and support the Red Plus project where land grabbing is occurring in an area which is not forested. Then the second point is that land grabbing often does occur in areas which are forested. It often occurs illegally or is unsustainable in terms of its management of land. And that's where we can look at integrating the safeguards that are integrated already in the Red Plus system into the land grabbing system. And just to highlight a few of these, these are from the Cancun safeguards. This is that there must be participation of all stakeholders in the land use change, actions must be consistent with conservation of natural forests and biodiversity, and there must be benefit sharing mechanisms, which at the moment are not happening in the land grab system. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and now we will listen to Harold Angelsen before we turn into our first panel of discussions, or set of discussions. So, I promise no maps, <laughs> and I will try to be the first one to get only one. No, <laughs> the time. That's the wrong way, so I failed on that. We'll go to this the one, right. The, yeah, but the then it was moving. The <laughs> one back, I So I succeeded in that, as you can see. There. Um, so, I'm not going to present a lot of new research, but, but some remind you about some important findings of previous work that we have when we discuss what is a long title, but could be shortened, how smart is CSA. Uh, I, you see. There. So, what is consider, um, Trying to, I'm mixing up this uh, this abbreviation. But the climate smart agriculture, what what is it, and what what does it mean? Uh, I think uh, ECRAF is working on trying to find a unified definition of that. Um, if you look at some a broad definition, it is a set of practices that increase productivity. Probably, I mean, there are different types of productivity. It's probably land productivity that one has in mind. That is the yield. Uh, it should enhance adaptation and the resilience to climate shocks and climate change. And it should also have a mitigation impact in the way that it reduces the emissions, as you've seen in several presentations. Of course, it's very difficult from a research perspective to, to, if you ask yourself, does conservation, sorry, climate smart agriculture, if you have defined it in that way, does it reduce emissions? Yes, by definition it does. So if it does not. So over the last one or two days during this landscape forum, I've been thinking of that maybe, I, at least me, I should start to, to look at, at climate smart agriculture as the sister of red. And by red, which I've, in earlier in the books we have produced from CFO, try to define as really very hard. And, and I'm more and more leaning towards the, the um, definition of red as an objective. It's an objective to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation plus something else that we are not yet sure quite what it is. And the same climate smart agriculture is agriculture that is both provide benefits, increasing productivity, has an adaptation aspect and has a mitigation aspect. Now there may be trade-offs and because there are three objectives already, but that I kind of increasingly prefer to watch it as a broad term. And then it's better, under this, there is a number of things that, that we can discuss with what exactly it is. Um, 
we are looking at the relationship between climate smart agriculture and, uh, and uh, you're also right, <laughs> missed this. Uh, the, the, so you have to reorder the, the, the letters here and emission removals. Uh, if you think of climate smart agriculture, one of the things is the minimum tillage approach that we'll also hear more on in a few minutes. Uh, there are basically two effects one have discussed. More is that you, you store more soil and more carbon in the soil, so you have a positive effect on that, more is stored. And you also, it gives higher yield, and because of that, you will also have lower pressure on the forest and contributing to reduce the emissions. Now, I think there are two links in this ba very basic thinking of why uh, climate smart agriculture should be beneficial. Now, the first is related to the soil part. Boop, boop. Um, and we already know that there's like three times more carbon in the organic soil than in the atmosphere. So, so it's really a huge potential to, for both removals and, and of course also for emissions if, that, if some of that, of that carbon is going to the atmosphere. Uh, the UNEP emission gap report, which I think is generally very nice reports, uh, predict that the, the potential is in the order of 1.1 to 4.3 gigatons, which is 4.3 is big if you compare it to the total global emissions of like 50, or in that order. And there was an article recently in Nature Climate Change that criticizes it and say this is a wildly overstated measure and says that in a in a new assessment that they make, which is just a fraction of of this estimate. And they have a lot of explanation why it may differ in, in the two approaches. And they report, for example, that very often you have that the topsoil is improved by minimum tillage. You have more carbon there, but it reduces the carbon deeper down because you don't have the turnaround of, of, of the soil and some of the carbon sinking further down into the soil, which may be related to the IPCC guidelines that, that only says that you should do the first or the top 30 centimeters. You look at maps, mass and not the concentration, and that may also be a different in the two systems. And it may not be permanent, this. I think, as a small comment, if there are some of the authors of that UNEP gap report, that I think it's also some unfair critique, and sometimes researchers, you know, exaggerate a little bit to get things published. Uh, and. Uh, because I think the UNEP emission report focused on the total agriculture, for example, a huge potential in rice paddies by, by reducing the watering of that. Um, the, the other part is less deforestation. Does higher yield lead to less deforestation? And that's a topic that I started working on while at sea for 15 years ago, exactly. And, and there are basically two arguments in this. The yes question is yes, you need less agricultural land to, to meet the food needs, to, kind of, to, to cover it. It can either be what, uh, what I have termed the full belly model, that you need to fill your belly here with a given amount of food, so higher yield, less agricultural land, or you can look at it at the global scale with the Bourlogue hypothesis and a global food equation. Now, as an economist, we will kind of take often another approach. You see, okay, how profitable is agriculture compared to other activities? And, there. and if you make, if you increase the yield, agriculture becomes more profitable and demand is not fixed. Uh, for example, there's a lot of agricultural commodities that are not food, uh, and, and which is much more price elastic than, than, for example, food is, but still it's not completely inelastic in the way that you have a fixed demand. So may you get a, a, an expansion into the forest? Well, that's an empirical question, and, whoops, it's really scope for improvement of this technology. <laughs> I have to conclude to make it more pushing smart or whatever. <laughs> um, what we studied, we said the conclusion is always it depends. But if you just say it depends and stop there, it's, a, it's really a very useless thing to say. Because you are not giving any guidance, so you just say the world is complicated and we're not don't know exactly. So in some of these cases, as we said, when are you likely to get a positive impact and when are you likely to get a negative impact on forest from a yield increase? And you can look here. For example, it depends on the scale. What, 
what is the output market? Are we talking about the local market that may quickly become saturated? The yield increase is more likely to produce a win-win outcome in the way that, that reducing pressure on forest. What are the farmer's characteristics? What are the characteristics of the technology? Are you saving labor or are you, are you increasing the labor demand? If you're saving labor, you're more likely to get a negative outcome for the forest, more deforestation. Uh, and, and a few other factors that I will not have time to go into. The take-home messages are three. First, don't assume a positive outcome. There's a good amount of research saying that if you have yield increases, it may quite often lead to more pressure on the forest. The second is that different contexts and technologies give different forest outcomes. It depends answer. But I think the key thing is then that when you are looking and considering a particular set of climate spot technologies, you should think of, okay, given what we know in the previous table and other studies, what is the likely, uh, uh, likely impact on forests? You can either say that, okay, we want to push it, but if you know that this is likely to increase the pressure, you do something. Or you can selectively design the, the interventions and choose among different technologies that have characteristics that is also favorable. So the key thing, don't assume it, study and expect a certain outcome and you can also design the type of intervention such that it's less negative impacts on forests. Thank you. Uh, can you pass me the, uh, the clicker, please? Oh, it's there. over there. Okay. Um, thank you. So, before we move on to the question and answers uh, Q&A session, uh, I would like to know if uh, our colleagues from Kenya will be able to join. Are they here? I don't see them. No? Okay. So then, um, our Professor Arold, uh, would you like to present your, the following um, presentation? Question Questions first? Okay. So, um, before we move on to questions and answers, I would like to quickly summarize uh, the, the, the outcomes of each presentation, the main idea, so we have this in mind during our questions. Uh, so first of all, we see that agriculture is a key driver of deforestation and therefore is also a key solution. Uh, second, uh, the mitigation potential varies across regions. Approaches need to be tailored to their specific local and regional circumstances. Then we also see that CSA is a technologically focused approach that needs broadening to address impacts on forest uh, change. Um, Sarah concluded that red and land grabbing uh, happen simultaneously. Integration and safeguards are needed for both red plus and land grabbing. And finally, uh, CSA has similarities to uh, earlier policies and assuming that higher yield reduces pressure on forests is dangerous. So with this, each one of the conclusions in mind, uh, I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, first, uh, we will take three and please say uh, who you would like to address your question. So uh, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Michael Bucchi, uh, European Commission. Thanks to all the presenters. I would have uh, one comment and uh, two questions for Rosa Maria. Um, so the first, the, the comment, wow, great. Uh, I thought we were years from having such maps. It's very impressive to, to see that. Um, now questions, how, how does, it, does it scale down to, to country level? Uh, that, that, are we, how long are we from having uh, reliable information at country level based on, on the same type of methodologies? And second question, when or have you already done the northern part, the northern hemisphere, and how does it compare? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the second question, who would like to add a question to that? Uh, this is really for whoever would like to answer, I think several of you could. Um, the IPCC in the AFALU chapter identified demand-side approaches 
uh, reducing food waste, uh, changing diet trends, as having a great deal of potential, perhaps even more than supply-side approaches. Mm -hmm. Did you include those as, is that part of climate smart agriculture? Uh, anybody have, or should we move on to answer questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Michael, um, or oh, Michael. <laughs> it's good to have good positive feedback. <laughs> I was in a, in a meeting in the TSU unit with IPCC, and um, they were constructively critic and about how scared countries would be to see a graph like this, because there is a process of endorsement, and uh, so it has to be done carefully, I think. Um, the great potential of this map is that it offers opportunities to countries that have limited data sets and it offers the window of, of saying there are all these data sets available, let's use them. Um, scaling down to countries, it should be very easy because it's a 0.5 degree spatial explicit map and therefore we only have to aggregate it to country level. Um, it's more a bit of an issue of how then you aggregate the uncertainties and there are certain assumptions about um, a spatial correlation and covariations between the different data sets that have to be assumed. There is an entire story to tell about the reliability of this data based both on the availability of spatial explicit uncertainties of the original data sets, which some of them had, some of them had regional uncertainties. So we have to take some assumptions when we run the Monte Carlo analysis on how we were going to, how we were um, assuming the spatial covariance between different data sets. So answering your question, it's straightforward to have country estimates for the aggregated AFLU emissions. And I think our next step is also to contrast it to existing data sets. There are other ongoing initiatives. One would be, of course, FAO, wonderful um, data gateway of emissions, uh, which is it's a bottom-up approach, and it will be super interesting to see how the top-down approach matches the bottom-up approaches of FAO. And then the EDGAR initiative from the Joint Research Center, which is a 0.1 degree spatial explicit data set. Um, the only thing with EDGAR is that it's an atmospheric data set, or it was originally created with atmospheric purposes. So I think it's also going to be very interesting, not so much land-oriented. So even though it has information about land uses, um, in where it will be interesting to see how these two data sets match. So country data, straightforward. And then, of course, you're right. Um, we've been running some analysis out of the tropics, uh, and, and definitely our next step is to incorporate also the emissions from the entire uh, planet. So the only reasons we did it this way is because one of the data sets had the uh, only data from the pantropics, which was the deforestation data set. So we don't have... Um, we have Matt Hansen's data set from the entire planet, but it's only activity data. It's only areas of the forestation, but then we have to assume emission factors. So it's going to be a, take us a bit longer. But yes, it's, it's go we're going to incorporate it for sure. Yes. Sure. Yeah, and Martin, will you answer the just, other question? Just on that point, and I mean, of course, one always has to be a bit careful to go to country level. These are data sets that are pantropical, at least they were presented there. I think we are benefiting from the fact that a lot of researchers invested a lot of time to put the data together for the individual land use fluxes and we basically worked with them to put them together. So that's, that's a process there that led to that. Uh, and one of the key values at this point is that you can contrast a bit regional pattern. I think that's one of the, the key uses I can see. But at this point, and we should be a bit careful uh, with mm -hmm. going to country level. Like I said, the uncertainties still are, are rather significant. I mean, we can, we, one can specify them. Uh, and uh, if the countries have their own data, of course, they should uh, use them um, primarily. Uh, but if there are countries who really think that that could be useful for them, then of course, that's one source of data that, that, that mm -hmm. can be available for that purpose. The second point is um, that Mariana was making that point uh, quite clearly that, of course, one of the next steps in that analysis actually go from emission, emission sources, emission hotspots to mitigation potentials. That is basically it's the first step to go in that direction and s some frameworks were shown a bit uh, um, on how that can be done, which leads me to to answer questions from Doug uh, on, the, on, the, on the demand side uh, mitigation. And we have not looked into this and I think it... Uh, at least not at this point, it's very, let's say, developing country focused. And I think that uh, that is also one of the things that should be done. Uh, 
whether that is part of climate smart agriculture, that's actually yeah. a very interesting yeah. question. It's not, not and not and mm -hmm. I personally, for me, if I see climate smart agriculture, and we'll hear a case study from our, I think in a bit is a very local thing, right? It's doing something different locally. That's where I see it a bit. And and if you think about the kind of the notion of you know just trying to think about you know forests and agriculture and all of that. That's an important dimension that's also missing, I think, in that whole debate. And if we think about the, you know, the one big sided case, Brazil reducing, you know, deforestation in the last couple of years, it is actually coming largely from that demand side too, with, with national policies and all of that. But it's coming also from that side. So uh, that is definitely an important part of that. That's not included here yet. Okay. Would anyone want to add a little bit to those questions? To Should we get? Uh, I would go for another round of questions. Anyone wants to do follow-up questions? Please. Hi, I'm Jonathan from Norwegian University for Life Sciences. Um, I study agroecology and I have met some restrictions or I see it as a big problem for for climate smart agriculture which by the way is the same acronym as uh, community supported uh, <laughs> agriculture mm -hmm. uh, uh, one problem I see is that in America for example there's very few farmers com uh, farming huge vast areas so how do you use climate smart agriculture on such vast areas and yeah, of course, there is the employment issue. How can we make people go back to the to the soil and work in the climate smart agriculture? Because it will demand more uh, employment, wouldn't it? Maybe for Errol. Who would like to answer that question? And maybe a follow-up question would be, could climate smart agriculture be a part of RED? Is that what you're saying? Is it funded by RED? Could it be that? I see that as a very valuable point, if it's possible. Harold? I'm sorry if that was two vague questions, but... Uh, <laughs> Harold, let's listen uh, to your ideas. Yeah, thanks. We may talk because you're probably studying on the floor below me, where I have my <laughs> office in Norway. Um, the, um, I think on the first point, it, it's a key one on labor requirements because in general in economics, you think that we want to economize on the most scarce factor we have. And in a lot of cases, it's labor that we have. This idea of surplus labor and in, in the rural areas, I think, is often quite wrong. So, so if you have very labor-intensive technologies, which may be good for the forest, because then you kind of don't have time to chop down the trees if you, if you do agriculture, to <laughs> speak, they, they may also be some reluctance to do that, and not just in, in say, in America to go, or in industrialized countries to go back and, and, and kind of take better care of the soil, but also in, in this. And I think it's a problem for the adoption that some of this may be quite labor-intensive these technologies. So there must be a clear gain that, that you get it. I also, just one of the points I may say in the next, I think that it's also therefore a little bit dangerous to just look at the yield and assume that if there's a yield increase, then its farmers are happy. They may also, they will compare to the inputs that they put into this. Uh, and I think it's obviously that, that for the second comment, that, that climate smart agriculture and red needs to be integrated. I mean, already saw that 70% or in that order is of the deforestation is caused by, by this expansion of, of agriculture. So therefore, that the solutions to red are in the agriculture sector. That's what we've said a long time ago, and it has to do that. And, and therefore, I, I think I, I, when I go to presentations here and, and read stuff on climate smart agriculture, I am a little bit concerned of the lack of the impact there. Because if the soil component is small, it means that it's huge. If it's 70%, it's 10, 11, maybe 13%, 14 if you take peatlands also, of the global emission is 70% of that. It means that the main climate impact of agriculture, well, it's not from life, well, it is a very big part of that, but almost an equal part is from this effect it has on the forests that when we
propose solutions for the agricultural sector, this is critical that we also include that, an assessment of what will be the impacts on forests. Thank you. So, uh, before we move on to more questions, uh, I would like to ask you to uh, come up to talk to us about your next presentation. Professor um, will be on, let me remember. I'm the same. As yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, here but you go. I should have been Hambulu Nguma from Zambia uh, for the next 10 minutes or so because it's his presentation. I'm just a co presenter. He's a PhD student who has done just completed some service in Zambia, and I'm going to present some preliminary results of that. And uh, yes. Um, now, we, we, we have just talked a little bit of definition. What, what is the focus in Zambia and neighboring countries is on, on conservation agriculture, which is probably a subset of, of what the climate smart agriculture is. And it's typically three, three aspects of that. One is the minimum tillage that should have and I show some pictures that, that illustrates what it is. Uh, and then it's also to, to, to have the crop residue retention, so at least 30% is permanent um, uh, cover of the soil, so you avoid the exposure of, of the soil and, and get releases of, of greenhouse gases through that. And the third is that you have some crop rotation with legumes to fix nitrogen, so both kind of fertilize the soil and increase the yield from that and also other environmental benefits to build up the, the, the soil stock. Now CSI we have talked about and read, well, I say no more. Oops. So here are some examples of this. This um, where you use sand draft animals uh, to do the ripping of the, of the of the areas, you can have it done in a mechanical way, the ripping where you just take the small, not go very deep. You can have whole basins, as we see in here, and, and also this animal draft power zero tilling that you don't do it at all. So all these are minimum tillage uh, practices that that we looked at. Oops, oops, oops. So these delayed responses are very dangerous. That, okay. Okay, I assume this was the next slide. Yes, it was. Um, so there are three aspects that I think are interesting. There's a number of aspects, and we, I was in a session previously that looked at food security, that looked at, at, the, at the adaptation part. Uh, so, now, adopt adaptation, not the adaptation. Here, I think the first discussion has been on the adaptation, I mean, how many starts using these practices and, and what they are. Uh, I'll show you some figures in the next slide that shows that the figures vary enormously based on what methodology you use. Some of the yield impacts are based on experimental plots and it may be hard to, to generalize and, and think that they will be, be uh, really can be replicated and give the same results when it's actually applied among farmers. Another problem with the, some of the studies that they relied on, you simply compare farmers with practicing, for example, MT and those who don't practice it. Now we know the standard problem of this. It's called this, this, uh, this uh, selection problem that you select yourself. So perhaps clim those who do climate smart agriculture, maybe they are smart in general, so they have higher yield. And we think that when we compare the climate smart farmers, well, it's not the climate smartness, but it's the smartness in other areas that gives the difference. So you have to kind of control who is enrolling into the program or not. It's not kind of a randomized controlled trial among farmers we are using. Normally, it's up to them to, if they decide to adopt it. And then the third on the forest impact, that is often assumed positive, but hard to get some good empirical studies. We try to do that now in this study, as will come if I push a sufficient number of times. So here's some of the examples of the huge differences in, um, in, in the yield estimates, uh, no, sorry, in, in, the, in the adoption of, of, uh, of this conservation agriculture. And you see that it's kind of different practice. Some is just on, uh, on uh, the minimum tillage uh, approach, if they adopted that, and others are more broadly. 
But is this the middle for the... Yes, it is. Small one. If you see here that the varies from 5 up to 41 percent, I think Hambulo uh, did a good study where he looked at a nationwide with 63,000 from the agriculture survey that was representative. We came up with a figure of 4 percent. It became quite controversial in, in Zambia when he said this because it was some were claiming, no, it's a lot more and kind of demonstrated kind of it is a success story of the projects and here comes you know, this very cold-hearted young economist and say, no, sorry guys, it's only 4%. Uh, but it has to do with the non-representativity of the area. Maybe it's not meant by those who produce this to be that, but it's used in debate to say that, okay, 41% of the farmers in Zambia have adopted this, whereas the, the figure is just a tenth of that. Oops, oops. The second one was on the yield, and I showed, would like to show that because it has some nice... Yes, um, so that's one of the more positive messages that, that we get, that the studies seem to, to conclude that, that, um, that this minimum tillage and conservation agriculture in general gives kind of significantly higher yields, which is the good news. Again, it may not be, I think from an economic analysis, you should look at what is called total factor productivity, which is to also take into account the inputs that are there. And from a farmer's may not, as I just said, not be interested in yield. If it's very costly to produce those higher yields, uh, it may not be beneficial to them. Uh, so here's my map. So I show that we can also produce maps. Um, the, that was a survey that was done in, uh, I think, August and ended in, in November, so it was, or October. It ended and it plotted the data and getting some, some results. Three areas of Zambia cannot claim full representativity, but, but it's, I think it's, it's a fairly reasonable sample and it was selected to give to represent different regions where you have some adaptation of that. It's a first analysis, and for example, the selection problem is not addressed here. So, here are some. One of the questions, and I focus on the forest part, whether what it does. So, about a fifth or so of the farmers did expand the land during this, this uh, season. So, here's the difference between those that, that have adopted um, uh, the minimum tillage uh, practices and those who have not. And you see here it's slightly above 20% for both, not really a statistical difference. Most of them do not plan to do that, but there's not a, a big difference in actual land expansion. We need to do more analysis to, to test when we control for this self-selection problem you see. This is the type of land they do it. We also ask what the plans were. Will you expand your land over the next five years? What is your plans? And, well, the minimum tillage are in green, apparently more green farmers and the others in yellow. Uh, definitely, yes, you see it's even higher for those who practice, but if you put these together, it's, it's not much a difference. Main conclusion doesn't seem to have a big impact on, on the expansion of land uh, by farmers, whether they do minimum tillage or not. Oops. That was... One. So... No, no, no. One before, previous. go back. One less. <laughs> yeah, I know. I push. Where's the? <laughs> where should I point it? Here. There. there. So, uh, just some concluding remarks on this: that the, that the conservation agriculture remains low and probably much lower than 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 we think. That's kind of the bad news. Uh, the good news is that it has a good potential to to raise crop yields and therefore provide additional income to the farmers. But again, with this, that it may not be the key thing that they are looking for. And the third question on whether it can save the forest or not, we also include a question to ask the farmers if they, if they do, and then a lot of them do not know, and uh, then there's slightly more to say that it reduces the need, but also a good proportion saying that it does not have an effect or increase it. So. The key conclusion also of this is that farmers are not sure and the researchers are not either and the policy makers and those who are promoting 
conservation agriculture should not be either. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> so we have about 10 more minutes for questions. Uh, so we will we'll open the floor again for people who would like to ask further questions. No? <laughs> okay, so um, I have a question for Sarah. I am interested to know about the data where the land grabbing came from, uh, the land grabbing data that you used to compare to Red Plus uh, data, and uh, if you found any differences in the definition of land grabbing across countries and if that was a challenge for your research. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. We used um, one definition of land grabbing, which came from the Land Matrix database. And so we just used their, um, their data, which also uh, fulfilled this definition. But there were a few types of uh, data within the database, and they also include deals which aren't concluded and aren't and, and somehow are failing to be realized. And we didn't include those um, incidences in the, the study. So it was only r deals which were really becoming finalized that we, that we included. Um, and the, the data are quite uh, rich because they show uh, the country who's investing or the countries, in, in a number of cases, it's a number of countries investing in that particular deal, um, the size of the deal, also what they're investing for. So we could extract a lot of information from each case, um, which was useful for the study. Yeah, I see, thank you. And this is a question. question. Oh, there's another question? Yes, please. Um, the microphone, please. Or um, can we give the microphone? Dean Thompson from World Region in Australia. I just had a follow-up question for you, Sarah. When you talk about countries investing in land grabbing, are you talking about governments or corporations that reside in those countries or both? Just wanted a clarification. Um, yeah, it's corporations which are based in the particular country. Um, yeah. Maybe governments are also doing it, I'm not sure, um, but definitely in the database it's uh, countries that come, uh, companies that come from that particular country. Thanks, yeah, I just wanted a clarification. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, any more questions? Yes, please. Hello, Life Young Force EU Red Facility. Could I just have a closely linked follow-up, I think. Uh, were there any attempt to overlay the land grabbing data with uh, tenure uh, patterns for particular countries or across the globe? I mean, across the data set. Yeah, no, that would be an interesting question. It's not something we did for this study. And actually, to um, the, the data are, can be seen as a bit unreliable because it's kind of reports of land grabbing, which maybe there's some emphasis of collecting this kind of data in some countries and less emphasis in another. So we took the approach of saying, well, to try and remove that kind of bias, we just say whether a country has one or more land grab incidences within that country, and then we class them all the same. Okay, this is where it's happening. So, I mean, it would have been interesting to say, yes, this is where more land grabbing is happening, and maybe why it's happening in a particular area, but it's not something that we did. It would be interesting as a follow-up study, for sure. Maybe overlaying protected areas. I think there's a lot you could do with that, yeah. Uh, uh, here, please, the microphone. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Stephen Moya from Uganda. I I'm just um, interested in uh, the last presenter. I think uh, the data and the information provided uh, indicating that there is uh, really not high adoption of the conservation agriculture practices. Um, it's, uh, 
it will be interesting to know what are the factors underlying that, and especially what is the overall food security situation? Has it increased? Has it, uh, are we um, finding that there is any change? Um, are there some factors, could be market related or what, that are not encouraging um, further adoption uh, of, of this? Uh, I think it would be useful to, to know whether the reason is that the technology is not working for them or the, the conditions, the enabling conditions are not encouraging further adoption. I just would like to know a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, um, then I give you the email address of Hambulu. Um, but I think from, from and, and I'm really not an expert on this, so you should address it. But from, from I've read and also discussed extensively with him, it's that it's partly that it's quite concentrated on areas where it has been promoted. So the, the low, so there are programs that promote it, and in these areas you have quite high rates of, of adoption. So, so I think, and, and then you often, when you have this technology adoption, you may reach a, reach a kind of takeoff when some farmers they see, and suddenly it, it goes from very from low to quite high. So, it's a, so it hasn't reached that stage yet. But a major, I mean, a, a very simple explanation is that the programs to promote it has not been widespread uh, enough, and that is. I think this this perception of the of the labor constraint is is important. I think also, but we have some more questions in in the questionnaire that we want to analyze. Is that that it's seen? They are not fully convinced about that. This is it's kind of traditional to do the proper plowing. That is what you really work the soil, and that's when you get the good yields. Is is a perception that that is. It's also common and that you try to, to change with the extension services. If you allow me, I will, I will also answer that question. Um, okay. There is some evidence that, especially in, in sub-Saharan Africa, one of the main problems is competition for biomass, so that um, the resource is too precious mm -hmm. to be kept yeah. in the soil, mm -hmm. that is preferentially used to feed animals. And it's not only your own animals, but also the animals of, of the community. Uh, that's one. And the other one is that there is some evidence, also experimental, that when you use conservation agriculture, you must invest in fertilizers. So when the projects are promoted and it comes with a package, the fertilizers come with a promotion, is adopted. But as soon as the project is removed and farmers have to invest themselves mm -hmm. on fertilizers, then there is no incentive anymore to have the same yields with probably a little bit more work. Thank you. So uh, I, I was just told that we have almost to finish, but we'll take your question and then we'll give concluding remarks. Thanks. Thanks. Um, we're racing ahead to climate smart agriculture now, but it seems like we actually haven't got conservation agriculture right at this point in time. I realise CSA is, is an expansion in some ways of conservation agriculture, but if we can't get conservation agriculture right, what makes... I guess the panel, you guys are the experts here today. What makes you think we can make CSA work um, better than conservation agriculture? Thanks. What's the question? What, what CSA would work mm. better than CSA? Oh, okay. Oh. Well, I could probably try to answer that. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, and there is a very long list of things that people think are going to be climate smart. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, changing um, livestock feed, uh, changing the way you use water with fertilizers, so irrigation with fertilizers, uh, agroforestry, agroforestry to increase uh, soil carbon so that crops are going to grow better. So it's a very, very long list of practices that could qualify as climate smart agriculture. And what Ariel was trying to say is that uh, there is no way to assume that every climate smart agriculture practice is going to have an effect on reducing deforestation and therefore each of them have to be evaluated technically, whether they indeed bring benefit to the farmers and economically, that they don't cost more. And the last one is, is it indeed having an effect to reduce deforestation? Okay, and Harold, you would like to follow up? Yeah, I mean, if, 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 
if you say that 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 climate smart agriculture is an objective, then it's uh, it's kind of we will be succeed. Well, it's will we succeed with all the different components under that to achieve that objective. Of course, it's not sure. And and some of I mean, it's a strong push for it, but so far we we cannot kind of demonstrate that it's been a great success in reducing it. At least, well, some of the approaches may, but but not really. Um, I think compared to red, and I've been trying to compare the two, two of red, I think the approach of red was very different. It was initially as an envision to pay the farmers for, for, the redu uh, for reduced deforestation. Well, whether that will succeed or not, and will we manage to get this, another question. But it was really to compensate for that. Because if you're conserving a forest, you are kind of abstaining from uses it and converting it to agricultural land. So it has a cost that... I think it's in much more challenging to find ways that make forest conservation directly beneficial to that, although there are ecological services, there are forest products that you can benefit. I think for climate smart agriculture, it's, it's less likely than this idea of paying them for doing certain practices, like a payment for environmental services. I, think, I, I, I see it's, it's much more problematic to implement, it's much harder to measure the emissions in agriculture than, than for forests where you just have to measure biomass and we are getting quite good at that. I think for climate smart agriculture to succeed and a slightly different approach than for red is really to make it beneficial to the, to the farm. So they see that they, it helps them, they get more food, more stable, the long-term prospects are good, maybe they can save also on labor and they may be able to, to withstand shocks of climate change. So, so the key of, of CSA is really make it beneficial to the farms and rather than the incentivize and compensate approach of red. So, so it differs, I think, in the approaches, but... Okay, and uh, to finish, uh, Rosa, would you like to add something? And then Martin, would you like to say some final comments before we finish the conversation? I think we are ready for conclusions. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Oh, and as you see, the conclusions oh, are. Is another question? Yeah. Uh, sorry? Qu another question if we have time? Uh, one more question <laughs> and then we're done. Yes. <laughs> Okay, oh, my name is Talenda Zimtunzi. Uh, I'm from Fanapan, uh, South Africa, Pretoria. On the issue of adoption of CA, I've worked with, uh, with farmers at local level. What I've noticed is that CA also depends on, on rain-fed agriculture, and it needs a particular amount of rain for it to be actually successful. Mm. And you realize that farmers, you need to, to plant earlier before the rain start. You're expecting rains to start probably in September, that is uh, in the context of Southern Africa, uh, in Zimbabwe, Matabel, and where I come from. And the rain doesn't come at that particular time. And probably the amount of rain that falls at that particular time is not good enough to sustain the, 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 the germinating crops for the next two, three months. <coughs> then that becomes a challenge in terms of, uh, of, of getting the benefits of, um, of conservation agriculture coupled with the fact that it's labor intensive. Mm -hmm. So if a farmer fails this season and fails the next season because uh, the rains are unpredictable, you don't know when, when they are going to come and the certain amount of rain that is going to fall for that particular season, then the farmers in the next season, they won't, they, they won't adopt CA. So what we need to do is to move to, 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 to irrigation. Oh. That will assist on conservation agriculture because it needs a particular amount of of water for it to be successful. That's the other thing that I just observed when I was working with farmers. Thank you. It's just a comment. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining the discussion. Um, and we thank you very much. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think. Yes, one more question. I think, well, I think we're oh, out of time. They, they yeah. she, she can talk to us later. In the... uh, Good, good afternoon, uh, ladies oh. and gentlemen. I would like to just have, a, I have a little uh, an opinion or maybe a question. Oh. If we are talking about the conservation, excuse me, I'm from Cusco, Peru. Uh, if we are talking about the, the conservation of the agriculture, are we talking about also about the uh, organic um, food? And what do you think about, about oh. the transgenic uh, food? Thank you.
Uh, Mariana? Sure. Yeah. Oh, um, conservation agriculture is a name that is given to the practice of conserving uh, mat organic material on the soil. So it could be organic or not, but the practice is this conservation of, of, of mulch on, on the top of the soil. And whether you are using uh, genetically modified or, uh, organisms or not is not what it makes the practice to be called conservation agriculture. Okay. Uh, the, the, the name of the practice, it only refers to the management of the crop residues left on top of the soil. Okay. Thank you. Thank, okay. you Thank you very much. Thank you.